it's and and you're talking here about the 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 principles and and uh, or should we say double standards again mentioning the douglas murray but paradoxically he established the center for social cohesion doesn't yeah. that be <laughs> that, doesn't that sound paradoxical to you uh i know he was he's a je, uh, je, uh, also was member i don't know if he still is of jackson society which is also mm -hmm. Um, very yeah, that's correct, Usman. That's a very important objection you raise. I like two points that you've just made, if I can elaborate on them. One is that are we really debating principles or double standards? Often they're core principles, but they're not. On the Douglas Murray um, issue, of course, he's a very prolific uh, you know, writer, commentator. He speaks very eloquently. I have to say that the Center for Social Cohesion, the idea is that, as you say, it's a paradox that you should be having such a center when the country is falling apart. You know, we call it the former United Kingdom now because there's no United Kingdom. It's a divided kingdom. You know, there's loads of, on a general scale, not talking about Muslims now, but the country. But the thing is that, to be fair to him, to understand his motives, what he's saying is that we can achieve social cohesion if Muslims stop being Muslims and became liberals. So that's his condition. Of course, it's an unacceptable condition for Muslims. So, in other words, there's actually no paradox in his own mind. You notice the paradox and contradictions, man, because you're looking at it objectively, saying, here's a man who's talking about social cohesion in society, yet the things he says are so provocative and divisive. The people, yeah, you say, but in his own mind, he's not. He's saying, look, we can all be one united kingdom, one united community, so long as everyone becomes like me. <laughs> That's a wonderful proposal, but the problem is, other people have their own convictions, some of which are uh, you know, diametrically opposed, and some of which, as I argued today, are conscientiously opposed, meaning the, your enemy is not necessarily some stupid person who's full of ignorance. He may well have very uh, decent principles, which is the spirit in which I approached Douglas Murray during the debate. But actually, he was quite abusive, not to me directly, to be fair, but to Professor Tariq Ramadan, who, as you know, is a major presence uh, in, in Holland and France. And I noticed that the debate became very personal against them. That's when I realized that these people weren't arguing. They were using double standards and they were trying to, you know, um, say personal insults. Not to me, to be fair, because they didn't know me in that capacity. Or perhaps because they secretly thought I had some privileged access to a, to a fatwa giving Ayatollah, which I don't, by the way. I am actually not Shia, I'm Sunni. Professor Akhtar, if we extrapolate this to the uh, to the domain of of Islam, this this uh, pluralism, mm -hmm. uh, you you if I just may uh, ask you, and then we will go to the questions. Uh, you talk about denominational diversity to soften the term sectarianism in one of your one of your uh, one of your uh, uh, speeches. Um, yeah. Does this uh, Rushdie affair and uh, and the Charlie Hebdo and these sensibilities translate equally in the realm of the entire Muslim Ummah, or in your view, this denominational diversity plays a part in 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 some way? I don't know if if I. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Well, you know, Usman, the problem is that the Denominational diversity of Islam, if we use a polite term instead of heresy and schismatics and there's other words, which have technical meanings in Christian thought, because remember Christians had a long problem with schismatics from their very origins. Yeah, we've not. Our main division has been the Shiite Sunni one, which unfortunately, unlike the Catholic Protestant one, it actually goes to the origins of Islam. The Catholic Protestant division is very late in Christian history. It begins in the 16th century, officially in 1517, with Luther. Uh, our Shiite Sunni distinction uh, essentially uh, occurs, as you know, uh, at a time in what's called the Fitna, you know, the time of strife among the early Muslims about the status of the of the repentant sinner, about the status of the political succession to the caliphate. So it refers to people who were actually known to the Prophet himself. So it's a very early division. So it's in a very different category. Not, I take it your question was one to be the how do we manage our own internal denominational and sectarian differences? Forget the West and its attacks. You're saying, how do we ourselves do it? Do we take well, of course, we are notoriously bad, I have to admit, at managing internal dissent. You know, every time there's a Muslim 
uh, group standing for very decent values, uh, trying to do good things. Unfortunately, very soon there's a splinter group. This, to some extent, we face a feature of all politics. I mean, for example, communist politics is also riven with divisions. Stalinism, you know, Trotsky, after all, was assassinated. So there's no monopoly of you know Muslim. All human solidarity split up in time and create as a natural uh, result of the fact that we are intelligent beings. We, we think different thoughts. No problem with that. The real question is, how do we follow the Quran's direct command? Uh, you know, hold on to the cable of God, hold on to the Hubble, right? Hubble Allah. The, this was a command given to Muslims. Now, you might say, well, it was easy enough if it was only a group of, you know, uh, tribes in a civil war in a limited part of the world. How can that now apply to 1.7 billion people? I mean, to unite 1.7 billion people is obviously harder than to divide, you know, say 13, 14 major tribes in the Prophet's time. Although, don't underestimate how tough it was, because in those days, they didn't have, uh, thank God, they were lucky not to have internet and all this uh, technological stuff that uh, I find very difficult. I think I would have been happier in the Prophet's time with basic communication means on a, on a horse. But just think, the denominational diversity of Islam is actually far, far less than that of Christianity, which is a lot more sectarianism in it. But then it's an older religion at a different stage of its history. It's basically a middle-aged religion, time-wise. Judaism is a senile religion, just not insulting Jews, just time-wise. We are still a relatively virile young religion. 1500 years old is not, 1500 years is not a big age in a religion. Obviously, you know, in an individual it would be, right? I mean, Hinduism is far older, Judaism is far older. So the denominational diversity of sectarianism in Islam is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it indicates that Muslims are zealous for their faith. They still care a lot. It's a sign of enthusiasm. Remember the amount of sectarianism Christianity had in the first five centuries before the church became a bit more established post-Constantine after the fourth century? Loads and loads of sects, yeah? But that's because people cared. So a small minor detail in Christian dogma could lead to a massacre of an entire town because there's a slight difference about the nature of the Trinity. Yeah, that shows people get. Nowadays, of course, Christians still argue with each other about these things, and there's literally a thousand groups. Uh, but by and large, and it's a good thing, people manage their enthusiasm peacefully. So the question is, what is the right kind of zeal? You know, when is it right to have resource to violent zeal, and when is it right to resort to talking? You know, we need more conferences where people intelligently debate the issues. Of course, there's the reality of geopolitics, meaning power relations. Yeah, like, for example, you know, you know, Shiite Iran versus uh, Sunni Saudi Arabia. That's not something, anything I say won't have any effect on that. One of the great privileges of being a philosopher, by the way, rather than a jurist, is that nobody actually listens to what I say. It's a great privilege. It means that nobody's misled by what I say, <laughs> right? So when I stand before God's judgment on the day of judgment, I can say, my Lord, nothing I said was heard or understood by the people. So please do not hold me responsible for any errors I made in my books. Maybe you, Usman, will have a tough time because you are moderating. Now you are complicit in this because you may, be, you may be blamed. But I mean, to, to remain serious, I'm saying that we have our own independent problem about management of dissent. I mean, thank God for a country like Malaysia, you know, where we have peace. I've lived in Malaysia. It's a wonderful country. You know, I'm sure they have their tensions. More or less, nonetheless, you know, it's not like being in Syria, you know, civil war. Remember, Islam arose as a result of a civil war between Arab tribes, essentially, right? Okay. Uh, some became Muslim, others remained pagan and fought to the bitter end. I hope that helps you in some way. Uh, you said no one listens to philosophers, and I would add, unless you have belonged to the camp of philosopher kings. <laughs> well, it's very kind of you. This was Plato's view, of course, that philosophers are the only true kings. But what he forgot to add was there's a kingdom that consists of just one person, the king, because no, no the citizens take us seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have a question from Angita Dini. Uh, Dr. Akhtar, what can we as Muslims do to help decrease Islamophobia? That's quite straightforward. What can we do? Well, what I'm doing is partly helpful, you know, write, writing a book of this type, uh, giving lectures, talks, inviting people on the grounds of their common humanity to discuss with you. Because don't forget, we are many faiths. We're fractured, but we still want humanity. I mean, according to the Quran, the best among you is he who is most honorable in the sight of God. 
right? You're all of monogenetic origin from one man, one woman. Um, we do not believe in racial hierarchy. No white person, no Arab is superior to non-white or non-Arab. Uh, so Islamophobia, well, the term itself needs to be perhaps explained to people. You know, it's a very recent uh, invention. It's in 1997 in the Runnymede Trust. Actually, it was coined by a group of Jewish intellectuals who were at the forefront of racial justice for Muslims in uh, secular Britain. And they said, look, you need some term equivalent to anti-Semitism, whereby people recognize that the kind of racism that's shown towards you is a very special kind. So to answer Dini's question, in the history of British race relations, at one time, everyone was politically simply black. When, when my parents came to this country, there'd be open racism, even violent clashes between the new immigrants. Everyone was black who wasn't white. So politically, we organized along those lines originally. Uh, you know, black didn't mean complexion. Right? I'm brown or, you know, fairly light brown, but I'm still brown. I'm not white. And there are colleagues of mine who work with me in race relations, including my secretary at the time, because I was the deputy director. She was Afro-Caribbean. It was very normal in a race relations body to have people of every background. Chinese people my, were also my uh, colleagues. The point is that because Islam is not really a race, but a faith identity, it differs from Judaism and Sikhism, which are both ethnic and religious identities combined. Right? So for that reason, there was no term against us. Because a white person, a convert, for example, or even a white person like you, Usman, who come from the Balkans, I mean, you look European to me. In your appearance, you could be a, well, I hope that's not true. You could be a Frenchman, right? <laughs> you are, in fact, thank God. Yeah, Europeans, but still struggling to get to the EU. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that, yeah, that's true. So what happened is that in the early struggles, politically speaking, everyone who wasn't white, meaning working class white, middle class white, but white nonetheless, pretty, was actually black politically in the struggle for our rights. Those rights and struggles were to do with making adjustments for Muslim demands about diet and dress. People soon noticed that Sikhs and Hindus were migrants who were willing to assimilate a lot more and that the Muslims kept on drawing objections. In particular, one big objection to the integration of Muslim migrants like my parents was that they didn't drink alcohol. And they would often decline at parties. And this was odd to people because in Christianity, people will drink socially. They won't get inebriated or drunk, that's immoral. And there's teetotalers, people who abstain from drink, but they're very small in number. Only some churches have that law. So we, we kind of looked odd to people, Muslims. And we also said modesty for girls, you know, let's say the sports competition, we're not happy with the kind of immodest attire that's normal. So you see how Muslims became to be seen as a problematic community. So that their concerns weren't just those of any other racial minority like Hindus and Sikhs. They seemed to be had this religious dimension to their objections to Western society. And then, unfortunately, there were some Muslim leaders who were a bit provocative, like they tended to give speeches saying, Western society is depraved, it's decadent, it's permissive sexually, drug taking, all of which may be true of a subculture or even of a major culture. But the point was that they were at the same time, many people in British society who weren't like that. I mean, they, they tolerated that subculture, but in their own lives, they may have Christian values, they may have liberal values, and they had children too. I mean, they were trying to raise their children as good Catholics or good citizens, and they'd be equally worried if their children were going to drugs and excessive alcohol. So they, there was a resentment from the mainstream society that these Muslims are somehow different and judgmental, that they're not like the other migrants who are from. Uh, and so that was the background in which the Rushti affair occurred in 1989, and it was, the, it was a watershed. It's the first time people realized that uh, Muslims said, we're not blacks, we're Muslims. Okay, and complexion-wise, we come from all over the world. Some of us are white, some of us, most of us are brown, some of us are black. Do you see the point? That it became, racism was too much of an umbrella term to cover every kind of discrimination. The Muslims themselves insisted on a self-identity that recognized that they were also Muslim, plus there's the color issue. So that was the evolution of the notion of Islamophobia. And what we could do, among other things, you know, uh, with regard to Dini's question is, we can educate people about these nuances and differences between Islamophobia and other kinds of racism. In Britain at the moment, we have this very odd situation that in fact, some of the most um, hyper-patriotic 
excessively patriotic people are former migrants of Hindu and Sikh origin. They're affluent, their new generation is well-to-do, and they, for example, were asked in a poll, would you object to Eastern European you know, uh, working class migrants coming to England? And they said, we don't want them here. You see, this was the attitude of British people towards people of my you know, parents' generation. We don't want factory workers and bus drivers to be Pakistanis and taxi drivers. Now we've got a group of brown people saying to other people, who are white actually, ironically, you can't come here. This is our country now. So you see how attitudes have evolved. And it's a very complex dynamic. And also I should add one further point with regard to the question of Islamophobia and race, is that the Muslims in England were very hard to classify in terms of their class identity, which is a Marxist concern, but a social concern. I'll take an example of that. A typical person in Oxford, for example, who came here, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, is quite wealthy because he owns property, which is very expensive here. He may also have driven a taxi at some stage, maybe doesn't do any more for health reasons, but he has property. He may be uneducated. However, he is considered working class in some ways because he's not highly educated. But look at the fact, how many working class people are millionaires? He has millions in assets from his uh, from the houses he lets to uh, you know white people, essentially, right? And furthermore, when he goes to Pakistan, which he does every time there's a funeral or a wedding, which is twice a year, he's a king in Pakistan. He belongs to the upper class because he can build a mansion right near the area where Imran Khan lives because he's got money. He doesn't have education, but he's got money. He doesn't necessarily have status in England. He may just be a tax driver, but in Pakistan he's treated uh, in a very honorable way. So you see how the class system also is very mobile and mixed up for Muslim migrants. They may be working class in England, but they are rich working class and they have a status in Pakistan as landowners. And furthermore, they may have children who unlike their parents have you know, gone to famous universities or become you know, doctors and surgeons. You see how complicated that is. Whereas a normal white working class man, let's say who works in a factory, his children are gonna like to be work in you know, a working class. And the final point is that to be fair, some of the white working class resentment, because I, I lived among working class people in Bradford and raised, actually is not unjustified because they have been overlooked. You know, the government has been fairly generous in helping migrants to settle, which is a good policy on refugees. But of course, it shouldn't neglect the rights and uh, misery of the working class on the white estates. That's why we have Nicholas, you know, uh, so the, Mr. Farage, the equivalent of our Marine Le Pen. We have a right, working, right wing movement with working class roots, but it's not something that is to be dismissed. On the contrary, I say to Muslims, especially those who become affluent, you should have respect for their rights and try to have a dialogue. So I normally talk to lots of working class white people, some of whom are privately quite racist, and they say to me, well, thank you for listening, meaning I don't feel gagged. You know, politically incorrect is not allowed on TV. In other words, they also feel voiceless. So let's not think that it's just, this voicelessness is a, any monopoly of Muslims, the other sectors of society. So that's my point about the appeal in my book. Let's talk to other people as human beings first, and then see where we can come up with a consensus. So you ad advocate a, a, a more di more dialogue, a more more debate uh, in in this uh, in this. But realistically, though, I'm no Sufi. By the way. I don't love everybody. Let me tell you. I'm sorry to disappoint some of you in the Sufi-dominated Bos Bosnia. I, I do believe that uh, fairness is a good thing. Dialogue is a good thing. Respect for the consciences of your enemies is a good thing. But I do not believe in the view which unfortunately is, is uh, considered a moderate progressive. The Muslims do not need power in the world. They do need legitimate power, like everybody needs legitimate power. Let me give you one striking example. Look at the United Nations. How many of the nations there have any kind of political or economic right of veto? All the people who have such rights are either former communist powers or Western nations. Does any Muslim country have such a right? I may be mistaken, factually, but a quarter of the world's nation, sovereign states, 50s, eight or 60 are Muslim. How come we have no say in any of the decision making? That's the level at which things need to change. We also need to have formal power so that when we are being oppressed, as we are more than any other community on earth, we're the most persecuted community on earth, from the Rohingya all the way to people inside Europe, like some French Muslim. How come we don't have any powerful representation? We do need that along with the humane impulse, which is one of the glories of Islam, that we like Salahuddin Ayubi, we do have chivalry. We do believe in talking to our enemies, but we also have principles of justice to uphold. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Akhtar. Um, we have a question 
related to uh, vested interest. Do you think there might be a vested, somebody might have a vested interest in using literature or cartoons to antagonize Christians against Muslims and to what end? I understand. I say, but in, an, in an educated secular culture, you have to remember that to some extent literature is a surrogate or a substitute for religion. I mean, it's been said that people used to go to church on Sunday mornings. Now they read the Sunday papers in their slippers and gowns. No need to, no need to get out of your clothes. Just start reading the, the Sunday papers. In other words, cultures become secular. And in fact, this was Rushdie's own point that literature is sacred. Religion is not sacred. Literature is sacred. I have a, I have a right as a writer to behave like a pope or like an ayatollah. I can offend anybody I want. Uh, and um, of course, that's a kind of absolutism or fascism, literary fascism, you know, saying that um, the word has that kind of power. Now, the question of fomenting tensions between these two religions using literature. Well, it may be true that there are, you know, extremist secularists who have such a motive. But why are the Muslims and the Christians themselves so juvenile and stupid as to be misled? Why don't they see through this? I mean, a lot of the people who write provocative literature tend to be of extremely uh, secular background. I mean, the, including the, you know, so-called Muslim figures. Um, um, Nafisi, can't remember her first name, the, the writer of Lolita, reading Lolita in Tehran, the secular Iranian. I mean, Iran as a nation has people who are completely uh, very devoutly religious and some who are extremely secular. That seems to be an internal issue. I don't think one can, you know, wholly accept the view that third parties are secret third party agents or provocateurs in the background. There may be some, uh, but I don't think it's entirely that. I think that there really is a genuine tension between secularism and Islam on some values. I think there's a real tension between Christianity and Islam. It has been said that the battle between Islam and Christianity is um, the war with the longest truce, meaning this battle continues so ever since Islam was born, it's been in conflict with uh, some Christian power or other, and originally with some Jewish tribes too. Not in the modern history, of course, except for the Israel question, right? Um, I wouldn't downplay the fact that these two religions make totalitarian exclusivist claims, which put them at each other's throats. You know, Islam does claim, after all, to perfect its two other religions, which is, in, in religious terms, interpreted by Christians as an insult. I mean, it's an insult to say that we needed a prophet after Christ was the culmination of everything and went beyond prophethood to become the son of God. So for them, it's a, it's a religious kind of provocation already. Islam is a provocation, no matter what Muslims say or do. The very fact that there's this religion in the world, which openly in a scripture rejects Christian sanctities, is not a sufficient reason for the hostility. I don't think, in my own opinion, I don't think you need to attribute this to the stalking of you know third party uh, you know conspirators who may be there may be an element of that but i think that the tensions between islamic values and secular values on some points are genuine that's why they need to be codified in law into how we manage this difference while acknowledging this difference we don't deny that difference so on sexual ethics there are many areas where islamic ethics is bound to differ not only on modesty but on more serious questions about the rights of a homosexual minority don't forget, it was only legalized in England only 40 years ago. So this was a matter within the church. But as the churches have liberalized, remember the churches have secularized too, Protestant churches, certainly less true of the Catholic church. Then obviously there will be tension between these secularized churches and Islam, which unique among monotheisms, refuses to uh, accommodate itself to secularism and instead insists on confronting secularism. That is politically an attitude that I think Western governments are increasingly finding that they can't cope with, where state law conflicts with privately held religious law. Privately held religious law meaning it's private in Europe. The Sharia is not private in an in a Islamic country. I think, that, I think the tension is general. I wouldn't want to entirely uh, attribute them to third parties without ruling it out absolutely. So you mentioned, and this is related to, to the question, uh, next question, you mentioned that the uh, blasphemy law was abolished and now these sort of offenses of re uh, religious sensibilities um, are treated under the public disorder uh, legislation, yeah. is that correct? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, now, yes. the public disorder is uh, subjective and uh, inter its interpretation depends on the policy of the nation in question. A uh, more liberal nation uh, um, would find the certain insulting cartoons in no way uh, cause for public disorder unless there are pub mass riots or on the streets, vandalism, property destruction, so on and so forth. Uh, so how, how do you address this, uh, this uh, imbalance between different uh, societies in understanding what public disorder might uh, mean? Thank you. Well, very good question. And uh, if I'd heard this question when I was writing the preface, I would have had to expand it considerably because I think it's a valid question. Well, there's two things. Factually, the Public Disorder Act, um, which is a 21st century uh, legislation, meaning at least uh, uh, 15 years after Rushdi, it actually has a section five in it. Section five is the bit that deals with the religious uh, dimension of it. And there are secular reformers, including Mr. Bean, the famous comedian, who wants that section five itself removed. They think it's giving too many concessions to religion to say there can be a valid ground for disorder. As you rightly say, this will depend. I mean, for example, disorder can be a fact on the street, you know, large scale riot. Still a matter of interpretation because somebody might say it's okay to, this is a healthy thing, you know, big bit of disorder, people rioting, so long as there's no mass kill, killings by the police, brutality, or there aren't killings at all. You know, the demonstrators demonstrate, go home. Um, you know, very tired and sleep it off. You're right. It's a matter of interpretation. What scale of public disorder would justify any legal prosecution? I accept that. Indeed, what counts as public disorder and the extent of it and the justification for it? Because it could be said, well, we only drew some cartoons and you guys went and demonstrated and beheaded someone. That's out of proportion. You are the ones who need to be taken you know, into legal consideration, not those who allegedly caused the offense. So you're right. It's actually not a solution to the problem. Uh, it raises many complexities uh, at the same time. Uh, but by putting it under public disorder, what you're doing is you're saying this is not a religious matter, which is fine for a democracy that's secular. But for the Muslims, that's a conceptually a very difficult category. They do think that the honor of the Prophet is a religious concern. Now, it could be the case that public disorder caused by uh, religious provocation can be interpreted purely in a secular way, or it could be the case that there's a religious dimension which is unnegotiable, right? So in other words, by putting it under secular law, you're saying it's subject to endless negotiation, what the details are of what counts public disorder. So that's your point, right? Um, it's also true that different communities interpret the liaison between their religious faith and their identity as citizens and their larger identity as human beings they interpret it very differently. For many Muslims, for example, unlike, say, secular Jews, it's hard to divorce or separate their religious identity from their political identity. A lot of Jews will say, well, we've lived happily under Gentile oppression and um, rule for, you know, two and a half thousand years. Remember, Jews have been ruled by Muslims in Spain. They've been ruled by Christian nations. Until 1948, they didn't even have a single place of earth that was entirely their own. So they might say, we're used to the idea of simply being treated as human beings and not necessarily as Jews, but just as human citizens. Muslims are not, because they are also an imperial civilization. We're used to the idea that I'm a Muslim first, perhaps, and an Englishman or British uh, nationality or the second. There are Muslims who actually have been polled, who've been asked to prioritize their identities in England. Young men, yeah? Are you a Muslim first and a British person second all the way around? Most of them said I'm Muslim first. See, that shows that they're identifying with the Ummah. Why is that? Because they feel um, that they're not accepted. If they felt more accepted, for in America, the statistics are the opposite. Most American Muslims say we're Americans. You know, the Muslim bit is, is irrelevant, which I know for, for, for my own experience of American Muslims, that they don't take their faith seriously. So they're very happy because they say, with some justification, that in Canada and America, we don't experience the level of racism that you experience in Europe, which is why you're so keen on your Islamic stuff, because you don't feel accepted. If you were more accepted as your children, maybe, maybe you'll play less on the Islamic identity card. So I think identities are also fragmented, hyphenated, mobile. So I wouldn't say that they are, you know, always fixed in, in time and space. I mean, Tariq Ramadan's work on European Islam basically 
argues the case that Muslims should stop thinking of themselves as aliens on this continent. They got citizenship, they should now feel culturally at home. That's a, a more tricky situation. As I explained earlier, the culturally there's very little respect for Islam. It's always associated with misogyny, uh, with nihilistic violence, terrorism. It's not a, a good image. By contrast, Christianity and Judaism, uh, uh, Judeo Christian civilization, is identified with humane capitalism, a degree of humane secularism. Because remember, we're not living in the Middle Ages, right? Where Christianity, of course, took itself very seriously. And Judaism, in its reform version, uh, is really a, a disguise for atheism. I hope if there's any rabbis listening, they don't get upset with me and put a fatwa on me. But the truth is, that apart from very orthodox Jews, many of whom live, you know, in little parts of Jerusalem, you know, they have the full headgear, they have their uh, phylacteries for praise of God from the Torah. I mean, apart from that type of Jew, most Jews are very assimilated. They're very successful. And they may not actually want to even emphasize their Jewish identity. They might say, look, you know, I'm living in the in the best part of history. We just escaped a Holocaust only 70 years ago. I'm living in countries like America that respect my cultural achievement. For, for God's sake, don't bring up my Jewish identity. You know, Woody Allen type people, yeah? I am Jewish, but he, in fact, he jokes. I am not a Jew. I'm Jewish, meaning slightly a Jew. Thank you, Professor. Um, there is a question related to the internal uh, Muslim divisions. Um, the question goes, um, does Saudi, uh, Sunni Saudi Arabia versus Shia Iran friction represent a central reason for the lack of global unity of the Ummah? If yes, what are the ways around it to uh, mitigate it or to remove it completely? Right. Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, certainly it's true that in countries such as Indonesia and the, uh, you know, the Islamic Orient, meaning Malaysia, Brunei, that there is some kind of surrogate struggle between those in those countries who may support the Saudi Sunni line, uh, maybe Salafi Wahhabi, especially in the aftermath of a pilgrimage to Mecca. They may come back and express more solidarity with um, uh, more ritualistic Islam, more form there. Um, and it's certainly true that uh, uh, Iran, because of the Shiite leg, will be perceived as being. Um, not only religiously different, but also an enemy of Saudi Arabia and its its American allies. You know? So I think there is. So I don't think that it translates um, simply into the fact that a rivalry between these two superpowers. In a way, I mean, Iran is actually a regional superpower. Saudi Arabia is economically a superpower, but obviously not politically so because it's dependent on American, uh, you know. Uh, help uh, to prop up the regime. I think it's certainly true that some of this in competing demands for fundraising and building mosques, let's say you want to build a mosque uh, or a Shiite place of worship in, 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 in Malaysia or Indonesia, it may be true that the Saudi versus Iran tensions are reflected in a surrogate way, yeah, to represent a proxy war, yeah, as the question is hinting. However, I think it's not fair to attribute it solely to this factor because these countries have their own indigenous history as well of factionalism, sectarianism. And it's not really, in the case of Malaysia, it's not really drawn on the lines of Shia versus Sunni at all, really. I think it's to do more with those Malays who, and, and Indonesians who may want a more multicultural, pluralistic society accommodating Hindu demands, uh, Christian demands, uh, Buddhist demands, and those who want a more purist vision of Islam as the sole state religion. The difficulty is that, and of course, you know, people like Dr. Farooq and Tansi Alba know this stuff not other than me, but from my limited experience of living in their wonderful country, I think that um, the demography, certainly of Malaysia, rules out a pure Islamic state because, you know, I mean, the numbers are you know, contested between UMNO and other factions about how many Malays there are, but the truth is that it's not Egypt. It's not Pakistan, where we have a homogeneous, more or less homogeneous society. Pakistan, a bit more complicated because some of the most influential and powerful families in Pakistan are Shiite, actually, of Iranian uh, linkage. But most people in Pakistan, in absolute numbers, are Sunni Muslim, right? And certainly in Egypt, overwhelmingly, with the exception of the 10% Coptic, 
Christian minority, everybody is Sunni Muslim. There are some Shia, and the Shia are officially tolerated by Al-Azhar as the fifth school of law, Al-Jafriya. They're a sect, Masab of Islam, rather than a sect in a negative sense. Yeah, they, they're part of the, the legal jurisprudence accepts them, and in my view, rightly so, because the, those differences are legitimate, they can be accommodated. They're not so great as to place them outside the house of Islam, whereas unanimously, it's been considered that the Ahmadiyya are considered, you know, apostate by a, by a fatwa. Now, that may be wrong, it may be reversible in, in, you know, in the next century or so, but it is in fact the case at the moment that they are officially classified as such. So I would say that there are geopolitical trends internal to Indonesian uh, and, and, and Malaysian society, the conflict between people who want a more comprehensive, progressive, slightly more secular vision, those who want a much more conservative vision influenced by perhaps by the states of Saudi Arabia and Islam. I think that some of it is internal and some of it comes through pilgrimage, trade links and individual links, maybe in the case of Indonesia, even by the fact that there may be, you know, some ancient families which have both Arabic heritage as well as local Indonesian uh, factors. So you mentioned Pakistan and the, some of the most uh, powerful families there are Shia, although it's a predominantly Muslim Sunni country. And the image of Pakistan is also that it is a very strong Sunni country, uh, whereas its founder is uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was a Shia, at least nominally. And uh, some of the regions in Pakistan, like Gilgit, Baltistan, have a predominantly uh, Shia population. So how that does that, can that serve as an example, as a unifying factor for the Muslim, Muslim Ummah, just adding, uh, following on, on top of the previous question? Yeah, well, firstly, let me compliment you, Usman, on your knowledge of Pakistan and its provinces, <laughs> which is very impressive. You know, most people, <laughs> Pakistan is Pakistan, right? <laughs> you seem to mention some of its provinces. Well, don't forget, we have a geographical border with Iran, right? And in fact, Urdu, Urdu, the national language, uh, is um, more or less, uh, except from some aspects of its grammar, is actually more or less derivative and very closely related to Farsi. And of course, our religious vocabulary is Arabic. And it, incidentally, the religious vocabulary of Urdu is actually Arabic, but it comes via Farsi. So for example, Salah, meaning you know, prayer, is never used. Uh, by My grandfather would call it Namaz, which is a Farsi classical word. So yeah, we are very much culturally colonized, actually, by, by Iran. So it's not surprising. As far as these big colonial families are concerned, these were secularized Shiite families. In, indeed, Salman Rushdie's were secular Shiite families. Yeah, it's not a Sunni name. That doesn't mean that many of his family members are Sunni. And may, he may himself normally have become Sunni because he didn't want discrimination as a Shia. But what I'm saying is that the origins of, a, because there's a large Shiite minority also in places like Lucknow in India, uh, who were related to various rulers who had Shiite linkages too. So, you know, Shiism is an important component um, of, of Pakistani politics. It's not to be, it's not, I mean, Bhutto family, uh, in my, they may have converted to Sunnism for political reasons, but their origins are Iranian and, and Shiite. So that's simply a fact. We share a large border, and sometimes Pakistanis will complain that you know Iran can foment tensions on the border regions, Rochistan perhaps, you know, and parts of Karachi doesn't have, it's got a tiny little link with Iran. Again, the feeling is that um, the Shiites are um, troublemakers in the politics of Pakistan, and there's a very passionate feeling for Sunnism in Pakistani Islam, indeed fanatical, meaning unfortunately to the point where sometimes, you know, a Christian minority, which is quite um, lesser individual members, quite harmless and poor, and they may be put on trumped up charges that this woman privately said something is the prophet. The real reason may be a land dispute where the Pakistani Sunni person wants to take revenge and he will camouflage it as religion. And this is one of the miscarriages of justice in Pakistan politics. I, I am. Sadly, I have to say that this happens quite a bit. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now, if I may ask you, you, you mentioned in one of your uh, articles or speeches that, uh, again, talking about the Shia Islam, that uh, it resembles Christianity. Uh, would you be able to elaborate on that? Yes, I would. Um, the, the Shiite political history is one of dispossession, uh, persecution, 
uh, and indeed that's the history of the early church as well. So before Constantine, it was a religion that was living under constant persecution. And of course, the Shiite or official narrative is that uh, the authority of the fourth caliph was usurped by his predecessors, and therefore the whole of uh, Islamic history is an error. I mean, Shia example do not take any pride in the fact that Sunnis will say, well, you know, we, we conquered the law of the world. And we were in a state of lenient and honorable ascendancy in places as far away as, you know, um, you know the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. Shiites, generally speaking, don't take any kind of pride in that. For them, they take pride in the Safavid dynasty, 17th century Iran, um, in which, of course, was a buffer against the expansion of the Ottomans. I mean, I personally think the Ottomans would have gone as far afield as Indonesia had there not been a buffer state of Safavid Iran, which, of course, as you know, prevented them. So it was a very serious cause of disun disunity in the house of Islam, right? Um, I mean, what I mean is that it seems to me that Shiism is certainly not in the beginning, when it was actually Iran was a Sunni country for most of its life. But after the, the 16th century onwards, I think there's a very conscious attempt by, by Shias to make um, their version of Islam into a kind of Persian equivalent or rival to the you know, Islam of Saudi Arabia. I think there's also some linguistic resentment among Iranians, uh, if I may put it this way, that you know, why didn't God choose Farsi to reveal his last message instead of the Arabic? I mean, they won't ever admit this to you, but I think that it's just below the surface. I've heard um, you know, Iranians say as much. Don't forget, Rumi's um, Masnavi has been called the Quran in Persian. Right? Look at the, how revealing that expression. We have no such idiom in any other Islamic language. Nobody in Urdu would dare to say of a book this is the Quran in Urdu. It's an unthinkable expression. So there is, I think, some, and don't forget the reason for that is because Iran is a, a more ancient uh, empire than uh, the Arab empire that you know Islam brought. You know the the, the Umayyad dynasty after the Khulafa Rashidun, the Abbasids. Okay, we can see these two of, of Arab origin going back to prophets on you know uncle and so on. Then we get the Turkic and Ottoman succession, which admittedly is not ethnically Arab. Um, so I think from a lot of for a lot of Shiites, um, there's been a basic mistake at the very beginning of history, as early as Ali, you know, whereby it, we all, it all went wrong. Um, so for them, I mean, it's a great irony that all the Imams, except one, um, I hope I get the right one, none of them is buried in Iran. I mean, all the Imams are buried in Iraq. Uh, Shiism is an Arab sectarian movement. It's got nothing to do with Iran. Or Farsi in its origin, you know, Nahj al Balagha and key texts are in Arabic. They're not. They're not in Farsi. So it, the truth is that it's a kind of um, it's a kind of revival of the national consciousness of Iran. That look, we, as you know, Raza Shah Pelvi said, we were a great empire long before the Arabs were upstarts. What did they know, right? Just because they've got a book, which they, which is you know from God, but look at. Persia, Persia, the old name for Iran. We fought the Greeks and we, we we injured them, wounded them. We didn't prevail over them, but we did put up a good fight. Then we fought the Romans, you know, the Christian Byzantine. Which other old civilization has fought against two empires and survived? But then they say, you know, those who are nationalists. Unfortunately, we were um, conquered by an Arab man called Omar ibn al-Khattab, you know, the, the Qadasiya battles and the dramatic fall of Iran. So I think there's been a feeling that history went wrong twice, once at the beginning of Islam, uh, and then later on when we accepted uh, mainstream Islam until the 17th century when the Safavids were very self-consciously Shiite, 12 were Shiite to be fair. So fairly close actually to be fair to, you know, normal to Islam, Sunni Islam, but the emphasis on Imams and so on is un-Quranic, extra-Quranic. There's nothing in the Quran about Imams in that sense. And then there are extremely exaggerated um, Goluf uh, in Arabic, you know, exa exaggerated claims on behalf of Shiism, where people think that an Imam is superior to a prophet, which cannot be accepted, or some small sect saying the Quran is incomplete, it's not really a full document, some of it's missing. You know, some of these accusations make these uh, um, allegations worse than any Orientalist. You know, even Orientalists don't generally attack the integrity of the Quran. I mean, Rushdie did, 
He said that the satanic verses is a confused catalog of good and evil rules, that the Prophet Muhammad himself didn't know the difference between good and evil. That's a very demeaning and subversive thing to say. Because on the contrary, Muslims would say, if any religion is still fairly in a literal and kind of consistent and almost fanatical about saying some things are definitely wrong, it's Islam. That's why we don't fit into the modern world. You know, if we accept homosexuality and alcohol, these are the two things I'm asked about the most at conferences. And I have to say, yes, these are, you know, considered wrong in Islam. And people are alienated by the answer. I mean, I can defend the freedom of speech in a nuanced way, but there's other issues in Islam that you have to give a decisive yes, no answer to. And I think people find that very upsetting about Islam. They seem to have such a clear moral compass. But people who convert to Islam say that's precisely why they like Islam. They see a chaos among liberalism and even modern Judaism, Christianity, where to some extent this, to some extent that. They're looking for some certainty. Um, and as I say, that can be a good drive. It can be a bad drive, however, if it's black and white to the point that you don't know how to live with people in a democracy, sector where other people hold extremely different opinions and you simply don't know how to deal with them as people. I mean, I'm personally surrounded by atheists most of my life because I'm a philosopher and almost all uh, uh, philosophers are atheists, certainly in Oxford and Cambridge. Thank you, Professor. Uh, um, one more question about Indonesia. Do you think yeah. that the mus Muslims in Indonesia should be worried about the aggressive uh, uh, Christian evangelist mission in Indonesia? I, I discussed this topic at length in my preface. The reason being that sometimes Christian missions are complicit in fomenting, you know, a degree of subversive comments by Islam, not necessarily outright blasphemy, but saying things, raising doubts that I think a lot of, you know, Indonesian youth, maybe at university, may not be able to cope with, yeah? Uh, which is, you know, why books like mine, not just this book, but many other books I've written, on every aspect of Islam may be a useful way of articulating our point without dismissing the anxiety express. Christian mission, I, I, I strongly object to it uh, only because I think that subtle and dishonest means are used. Where Christian mission is sincere and honest and openly carried out, I don't object to it uh, because uh, a good Christian life lived according to true Christian principles is often uh, one that as a Muslim I can admire as well. Uh, indeed, I think that our Muslim Sufis, in my opinion, are followers of Jesus Christ, not of Muhammad. Um, so I advise Sufis to become Christians, but Christians <laughs> of the right kind. Yeah, I've often given this fatwa, you know, that Sufi brothers and sisters are free to leave Islam. They haven't taken me seriously, I noticed. Remember I told you, Usman, philosophers have no influence. Can you imagine if I gave the fatwa as a jurist, how much influence they would have had? So, what about yeah, Leo Strauss included? No influence? Who's Leo Strauss? Who's oh, yeah. well, yes, yes, interesting uh, question. Let me just finish the point of Please. this one. So okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll comment on that. Um, yeah, Leo Strauss, very important thing. I mean, I think that insofar as Christian missions are honest in their charitable work, they'll say we're Christians, we've come to help, you know, humanitarian relief, wonderful, welcome, yeah? Just like Red Cross, you know, the, so the Red Crescent goes to lands to relieve suffering. This we all agree on, Buddhists, conscientious Muslims, Jews, we can help to relieve the suffering. You know, a child who's suffering, it doesn't matter if somebody who's feeding him is a Christian missionary or a Muslim mufti. And in fact, my own experience, Christian missionaries are far more willing to go to deprived lands and take greater risks to relieve suffering than many Muslims are. Most Muslims I come across, you know, who are at least ritually very devout, uh, they seem very self-satisfied, they have a big, wonderful meal at night and pray and go to sleep without any regard for the fact that their neighbors are suffering or the Ummah is suffering, let alone that the human race is suffering. So I have to commend the fact that in my own native land of Pakistan, that is, you know, a lot of Christian missionaries offer humanitarian services. You know, cure of the eyes is a very big thing, free cure of the eyes. Where I object is in, in the Indonesian context to Christian missionaries, the dishonest tactics are sometimes used, using Islam alaikum or using the word Arabic or Allah, or making a mosque look, uh, sorry, a church look like a mosque, saying this is just a place where we um, honor Jesus Christ, which you do too as Muslims, which is misleading, because we don't honor Jesus Christ as the Son of God. I think no Muslim missionary or die has ever used such subversive and, and dishonest tactics to convert people to Islam. People openly say, we're Muslim, here's a copy of the Quran. 
I find that the uh, Christian missionaries are uh, very aggressive and that they conceal their tactics. And I cannot approve of that. I regard that as immoral. And I, I, I by the written, written on this topic, unfortunately, it's not been published anywhere because I've had some opposition from Muslims, in fact, who are unhappy to, you know, have such things in print that may upset Christian missionaries. But I think that on a human level, Christian missionaries should ask themselves, that is it right to use immoral methods to get people to convert to a good religion like Christianity, whose moral, uh, moral message is not one that as Muslims we, we reject. In fact, I often say to the good Christians among my uh, friends that if the whole world were Christians like you, meaning truly renouncing violence and aggression and colonialism and leading a good moral life, I'd have no problem at all. But I do, I do mind the fact that sometimes the Christian missions may be using dishonest, duplicitous methods and that they may be working, in some cases, as agents of foreign powers which are quite powerful. So for example, if an Indonesian missionary has strong links with the Defense Department in America, well, then obviously I'm concerned. You know, are they gathering information about Muslims or are they generally, you know, preaching the the very remarkable gospel of compassion that is Jesus Christ? Because the Quran itself commends the gospel of compassion and says that those who follow Jesus, we placed rafa, rafa means mercy, into their hearts. So it's not, we're not objecting to the moral the compassion. We objected to the idea of dishonesty. Mother Teresa was a missionary who worked in India openly. She didn't say, you know, I'm really, a, I'm a Muslim and then mislead people. So I'm very concerned about that. However, I should also add in fairness that where uh, Christian minorities are being oppressed uh, in a Muslim land and where they do not represent a foreign power, like Filipino uh, cleaning maids obviously are not connecting, you know, surveillance data for the Philippine government, right? If they are denied their right to worship as Catholics, I think that's immoral and unfair. I think Muslim employers should respect their conscience and say, look, we can't have a big grand mosque, but we will provide, you know, private chapel facilities for a Filipino nurse or her family to pray in the, in the faith of the Ahl al-Kitab. I'm very much in favor of that. Indeed, I've written about this in defense of Christian minorities who I feel are oppressed in Islam. But if the Muslims say, look, the Copts are not just Copts, they're not just Christians, they're working on behalf of the Lebanese you know, secret service, or they're working on behalf of American, not just American missionaries, but of some clandestine operation by the American, then, you know, if it can be shown to be true, uh, then I think we do have every right to be suspicious of their motives. I, I hope the, the, the person who asked the question is satisfied with the answer, but uh, I, I thank you immensely for, for that uh, elaborate answer. Now, Professor Attar, we only have a few more minutes left. And if I may ask you, I think it's, it's an important question, maybe a central uh, to some of your uh, writings. You, you talk about uh, and speak about centrality of evil and the and and uh, you mentioned Srebrenica genocide yes. in Bosnia and Herzegovina in one of your speeches and and I recall you said this this kind of things lead people to even leave the faith a lot of people become Muslims but some people leave Islam as well and yes. some cite evil how is it possible that God allows this evil to happen and uh, from a philosophical and theological point of view if you can just elaborate yeah, on that. But, yeah sure well um, in modern European society by contrast with Muslim society the centrality and prevalence of gratuitous evil meaning evil of the kind that we see in the massacres and it's not just ordinary evil but to an absolutely shocking appalling extent has been one of the major causes of atheism. Apart from the two world wars, in the aftermath of which Europeans lost faith in the Christian God, saying Christianity is not capable of preventing evil. So what good is it? I fear the same question may be posed by Muslims who might say, well, if Islam is the best religion, how come Muslims are constantly cutting each other's throats in civil wars, fighting among themselves? This is not a new story. They've been like that. I think it's a difficult question. The only generic answer is the freedom of the will of the human creature which God has given us a sign of our dignity, that we are at liberty, at least during this fixed tenure in this life, to reject God. We'll be punished for it spiritually, certainly. Um, I think the exercise of freedom of the will means that we're not puppets or robots. We are free to do evil, just as we're free to do good, including conspicuous good, like the mob good that a saint does, 
or our profit then. But unfortunately, on the other side of the scale, we also get people not only the evil that we all do to some extent, but of conspicuous, spectacular evil. You know, like the sort of thing that a Serb army might do. Uh, I, I say this is a, a liability and an asset of the fact that God said to the angels in the Quran, Surah 220, who did object the bloodshed, that I know something you do not know, meaning the fact that when humans are good, they can rise to far above the angels and do the kind of virtue that pleases God. When they're evil, unfortunately, we have to take the good to the bad, to use a cliche. Thank you. On that note, um, I would like to officially thank you, Professor Rahtar, for this uh, immensely uh, interesting and uh, engaging discussion. Hopefully, we will be able to continue on some, on, on some of these issues. There are so many issues that uh, you deal with in your writings and they deserve uh, a lot of uh, discussions and debate. And now the time is running out. So thank you on behalf of the Islamic Renaissance Front uh, for participating and for taking uh, free time from, from your busy schedule to be part of, uh, of the Islamic Renaissance Front webinar. You're welcome. You're welcome. On behalf of uh, the founder, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ahmed uh, Musa, Farouk Musa, and also the executive director, Azrul Asmadi, and, and our program coordinator who put this all together. And thank you to our listeners who tuned in. And, uh, we will have our next uh, webinar hopefully in two weeks time it will be announced on on the islamic renaissance front uh, website so hopefully uh, we will be able to once the coronavirus subsides or is resolved and the vaccine is found to uh, get together sometime in in physical presence in kuala lumpur or elsewhere in bosnia to continue uh, this and other discussion. Thank you so much for uh, participation and thank you, appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you, Swan. Welcome, Swan. And thank you to everyone who's been involved. Thank you.